Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by the Public Theology Project at Christianity Today. Every week here, we explore conversations and questions from a Christian perspective, and this week is one of the questions episodes. So before we even get started, let me invite you to send whatever questions you have about anything, questions at russellmoore.com. And sometimes what people will say when they write in is to say, well, I don't know whether this is a, a, you know, a good question to ask or whether you'll feel comfortable answering. Well, I'm not going to answer something that I don't, uh, that I don't feel comfortable uh, uh, answering, so don't don't feel bad about asking it, uh, whatever it is. So questions at russellmore.com is where you can send those and um, for, for the next episode. And I'm going to try to do the next questions show um sooner than than the amount of time it took to do this one. So the first question that we have is from a woman who listens from an overseas city. Uh, she doesn't want to, to, to reveal who she is. I'm not going to reveal her city, uh, not because she asked me not to, but just because, you know, this is a kind of a sensitive uh, question. Uh, so I'm going to protect her uh, extra uh, this time by not revealing her city. But let's just say it's overseas. And what she's writing in about is to say she's engaged and she's engaged uh, at an older uh, age than most people. Um, she's uh, in her 40s and her fiance is in his 50s, I believe she said. And she says that there's a medical issue that might uh, prevent her future husband from being able to be intimate. Let's just uh, put it that way. And she writes in and says, you know, what do I do? She says, what happens to a Christian marriage if for medical reasons uh, there cannot be uh, any intimacy? Uh, Should I, in fact, marry this person? Um, Well, what I would want to say is, if if it is as you as you are intimating here that this is a medical uh, problem, then that's one thing. It would be another thing if what he's saying to you is, "I don't have any interest in intimacy. I don't have any interest in you." The, the second one would be a red flag to me uh, for all sorts of reasons. But the first one, uh, no, I don't think that there's anything that would prohibit you. Uh, from uh, marrying him. Um, Mary and Joseph uh, were married uh, in Scripture uh, before uh, she gave uh, birth to Jesus, and and the Bible speaks of that as a legitimate marriage. And so if everything else is, uh, is, is working out all right in terms of marrying him, and this is a medical uh, issue, I don't think there's a problem at all. Uh, with getting married any more than there would be. uh, I mean, eventually, uh, everybody's going to have some sort of uh, bodily breakdown uh, in in our lives. And that doesn't mean that the marriage uh, goes away. So if this is good with you and it's good with him, I don't think there's anything biblically that uh, that would prevent you from getting married. So if he's saying instead, uh, I just don't know if I'm going to be able to be intimate with you, and it's not a medical issue, then I would talk that through with the counselor, um, and I would make sure that I go through some premarital counseling to find out why that is and, and what the hesitations are there. And it may be something that you can uh, that you can easily work through, but it might not be. And so check that out. Similarly, on a a marriage uh, sort of issue, there's someone who writes in and says uh, she's referring to the um, uh, article that I did years and years ago. Uh, It seems 15 years ago or so uh, to me uh, called uh, Should I Marry My Non-Christian Pregnant Girlfriend? Uh, A lot of times I I don't remember what I write at all uh, after. I don't I genuinely don't remember what I wrote about in the last week's newsletter <laughs> until I go and, and look at it before I'm writing uh, the, the week's newsletter. I just don't remember things like that. But I remember that one. And the reason I remember it is because at that time, I had sort of an automatic Twitter thing that would uh, that would post an article when it came up with just the title. 
And so what came up was, should I marry my uh, non-Christian pregnant girlfriend? And a friend of mine, Kevin Ezell, who's president of the North American Mission Board, responded, no, stay with Maria. And so I, I, so I remember that question uh, all the time. She writes in to say, uh, basically, would you counsel the woman similarly to how you have the man? Uh, she was in the relationship. Uh, I guess this is a friend of hers. Um, she was in the relationship and had the child before she became a Christian. She's now a believer. Should she repent of sin, receive the forgiveness of Christ, and move forward with her responsibilities? Because that's what I said to the um, the young man who wrote in and says, you know, I, I believe that it's wrong for a Christian and a, a non-Christian to marry each other. And he said, but this has happened, and uh, my girlfriend is pregnant, and we're both really grieved about um, about that. But what do I do? And so what I said was, if everything else uh, is is equal, then uh, th- then I think that you you can indeed marry her without any uh, conscience problems about the Christian non Christian. Uh, relationship because the Bible says, uh, the Apostle Paul says, for instance, in 1 Corinthians uh, 7 and 8, that if somebody's a Christian and is already married to a non-Christian, uh, that, that, that doesn't mean that the marriage is is null and void. Uh, he says that, that your presence sanctifies the marriage. I said, in this case, you already have uh, an entanglement uh, in the sense that you are you are already joined uh, to this uh, unbeliever. So however you interpret that, that part has already uh, taken place. And so I advised him because he did. He wanted to he wanted to marry her. He loved her. Um, and he wanted to be a dad to his child. And I said, marry. Uh, I, I think that that's uh, the right thing to do. She says, would I say the same thing to a the, the woman? And would I say, well, you're a mother now, or would I advise her to separate uh, from, from the father? And, and this person says, I, I just can't bring myself uh, to tell this young believer to marry this, uh, this non-believer, uh, even though he's the father of her child. And she says he's not at all uh, abusive or unkind or, or anything else. She says, but the problem is that she is now alive in Christ and she would be binding herself to a corpse. Uh, well, I yes, first of all, I would say the exact same thing to the mother that I would to the father. That The, the exact same principle uh, applies here. And so, uh, again, I would say if there's not uh, some other reason why she shouldn't be married, I just don't think that, um, that the biblical prohibition um, against um, unequally, being unequally yoked would apply to that situation. Uh, they are yoked together, and, and they will be yoked together for life because they have a child together. And so I, I don't think that there's any reason why Jesus would say, uh, break up that relationship and and have your child with a uh, a father and a mother who are not together. Again, in many cases, that's necessary. And if you had been saying to me, uh, this is someone that uh, for some reason she doesn't want to marry, uh, he's unkind, he, he's, uh, he mistreats her, there's something like that, then I would not have the same counsel. But if the only obstacle that she has is to say, well, uh, he, he's, not a, he's not a Christian and I am, I don't think the Bible is speaking to that situation. She, she is yoked together with him. So yeah, I would say the exact same thing to mom as well as to dad. And I think in your case, sometimes uh, when people say, I just can't bring myself to recommend that someone marry, even with all the caveats that you've given here, sometimes there's a little something in your mind that you're saying, I see some red flags. If that's the case, this doesn't apply. Uh, but if the, if the only problem that you have is that you think that, uh, that that somehow this would be biblically prohibited, I don't think so. But I'm not going to bind your conscience on that. 
And so if you if you think that the Bible teaches otherwise, then don't violate your conscience. I would just say I don't think the Bible does. Um, and uh, but in, in this case, I think that yeah, I would have the exact same um, the exact same advice. Uh, someone writes in. Uh, oh, and this is someone who says um, that uh, he's willing for me to use his name. So this is Sam who writes in and says, uh, what are the issues with a church flying the American flag? Should a church fly the American flag? Well, um, I answered this question years and years ago. Uh, Christianity Today used to do these kind of point counterpoint um, uh, articles and there was one with three different views on um, on flying the American flag and so there was a viewpoint that said no you should never fly the American flag I think that was Doug Wilson uh, and then there was uh, someone else who said yes uh, show your your support and patriotism and, and fly the flag and then there was me saying, well, it depends <laughs> on the circumstances. The reason I remember that one is because of the illustration that had the, the pro flag person with an American flag um, and, and I'm there with a white flag. And I'm, I'm, I don't have a white flag here. And I, if I put the American flag in my, in my hand, maybe just add the Christian flag uh, with it would make me feel better. And I, you know, Doug Wilson's a whole other story that, I can go into later. It doesn't have anything to do with this. Um, the reason that I said it depends is because I think there's a difference between a church that's starting and uh, maybe it's a new church, it's a church plant, and they are uh, thinking through what's being communicated with uh, the flags in the, in the sanctuary that's very different from an already existing church that has a, a flag in the sanctuary. I have known people who've gone into ministry, come to a church and taken the flag off uh, the platform. I mean, I, I knew one, uh, one pastor, one of my uh, former students, who went in a Saturday night and just took the flag away so it wasn't there the next Sunday morning because he didn't think it was uh, appropriate. And I said, that's not the right way to handle it. And I called it Rapture the Flag, a uh, game of Rapture the Flag. I don't think that's the way uh, to handle it because uh, you're going to have people who are naturally going to say, well, what, what are you trying to communicate about that? So if you have a congregation that has a great deal of confusion about the kingdom of God uh, as it relates to, uh, to the nation, uh, and of course, we have a, a great deal of that uh, right now uh, with the, the rise of Christian nationalism in its more malignant, toxic form, but also just in the softer forms of kind of God and country um, religion, where uh, the, the love of country, or in many cases, I don't even think it's love of country, it's sort of a an identification, a tribal identification with the country seems more immediate uh, than the gospel does. Okay, it, sometimes you're going to have that and you're going to ask, what does this flag, what is it intended to communicate here? So in some cases, what it's communicating is um, the American flag is, is paramount here when the church is a, a colony of the kingdom of God. So, so when you're gathered together in worship, you're coming to the heavenly Mount Zion, which is, is not located in any um, state in the USA or in any other country. You're being joined to the, the global body of Christ that transcends heaven and earth. So you, you need to have a sense of that and a sense of weight of that uh, in worship. That said, that does not mean that when you're coming into worship, you're pretending as though you're not in any specific location. Uh, and so there are people who have an American flag uh, in, their, in their congregations where what they are intending to signify 
is 1 Timothy 2, praying for leaders and all who are uh, in authority, and a general sense of gratitude uh, for being in a, a country that uh, that provides for the, the freedom to worship openly and, and those sorts of things. I, I think in that sense, that's recognizing a natural affection. And if you can do that, in a way that doesn't eclipse the gospel and doesn't confuse the gospel, then I don't think there's anything in scripture that would prohibit it. Generally, the advice that I give to people is uh, rather than take away flags, why don't you add them? And so you can have a situation where, uh, in many congregations where I've preached, there are flags of multiple nations that represent, for instance, um, the countries where, where that church has missionaries or uh, countries around the world where they're praying for persecuted Christians. So you're, you're recognizing your your own country, for those of you who are Americans, and you, you're seeing we're, we're not pretending that we're not coming from this uh, place, and yet we're recognizing our connectedness to, uh, to others and the fact that, that the kingdom of God is bigger than all that. So that would be my general, uh, my general approach to it. And I, I think there, there are just a lot of people who aren't trying to communicate um, anything counter kingdom uh, with that American flag. And I say that as somebody who been one of the most uh, shaping and vivid uh, memories of my life is uh, vacation Bible school in my uh, home tradition, Southern Baptist uh, tradition. Uh, every year we would um, march in to the sanctuary, someone carrying the American flag, someone carrying the Christian flag, uh, someone carrying the Bible, uh, and we had a pledge to the American flag, a pledge to the Christian flag, a pledge to the Bible. Those are all ingrained in my memory in the same way that there's a certain kind of chime uh, that meant stand up or sit down. If I hear that, I'm going to stand up if I'm sitting down. And if I see that um, that kind of a, a round kind of flower shaped um, shortbread cookie with a, a hole in the middle of it with red Kool-Aid, it just immediately takes me back to vacation Bible school. I, I don't uh, I don't necessarily think that anything harmful was being communicated, although uh, what I would do is come in and reorder the priority. Uh, of those of those things, and, and certainly, if I were starting out, there would be maybe a different way that I would that I would want to find to to talk about those uh, natural affections that we have for for country. Uh, and in that context, I think that that if that were the only thing happening, that might have been a problem. But they, they actually did a very good job in reminding us of the fact that we are. Uh, connected to Christians around the world and on mission with non-Christians uh, around the world because there was such a missionary emphasis. So that's just my thought on that. I would just say have patience with people who don't uh, see things quite the way uh, that you do. And, and oftentimes you're going to find that as time goes on, you start to, um, you'll start to, to converge in the way that you see it. Not always but uh, sometimes. Uh, someone writes in and says that, I don't remember if this is he or she, but writes in and says, recently I confessed some sins to my parents that I committed long ago. And one of my parents said this sin didn't involve us and that I didn't have to tell them anything. It didn't matter if I told them or not that all this was between me and God. And they cited the familiar passage of 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And this person says, I often struggle with the guilt of my past sins. And while I know God has chosen to forgive me, I usually wrestle with this truth more than the other things that the Bible teaches about him. And it was through this guilt that I thought I should take uh, take this to my parents and confess it to them. I just felt a little discouraged when they said what they did. I know James 5.16 says that we should confess our sins to each other and pray for each other so that we might be healed. And while I recognize that God is the one who forgives us, I'm wondering why I still felt the desire to tell them. And so th this, uh, this uh, listener says, I guess my main question is, how do we remind ourselves that God does forgive us even when we don't feel like it? 
And in regards to confessing sins to each other, how much should we as Christians share our past sins uh, with each other? Now, that that is a really good and multi-layered uh, sort of question. Um, I think I have uh, referenced uh, here or, or somewhere about uh, the experience that I once had in a church setting with, uh, there would be small groups of people that would gather around and usually at some point somebody would start confessing uh, some sort of sin or or trying to heal relationships that had been broken. And there was one woman who would uh, come in and say, you know, I just want to apologize to you, uh, Craig, because I, you know, I've always just hated the sound of your voice. And, you know, I know that everybody just gets so annoyed when you walk in the room, but I shouldn't do that. God's called me to be uh, a Christian and I shouldn't have those feelings. And so will you forgive me? Well, at the end of that, Craig is just thinking, is everybody annoyed when I walk in the room? I mean, you, you have not helped anything uh, in, in his life by doing that. But now you're exactly right. James says for us to confess our sins uh, to one another. There's obviously a right context, and there are certain people uh, that you would confess your sins to, and other people that you wouldn't in the same way. I mean, there there are things that you would say to your uh, close friends or your pastor or your spouse or someone else that you wouldn't put on a billboard. Uh, and, and I don't think that's what the Bible is is calling you to do, or that you wouldn't put uh, up on the, if you have a screen in your church with announcements, you're, you're not going to to put up, you know, Flossie asked for forgiveness for the fact that she got drunk again last week or something like that. That's, that's, not, um, that, that's not what I think the scripture is teaching. So I think probably the reason that you wanted to, um, to confess this to your parents is it's probably because you do feel like in some way that you have uh, disappointed them. I mean, we all, we all do in terms of our parents. There's a, a sense where their approval or disapproval just matters uh, a, a lot more than, uh, than anybody else's. I mean, that's just, that's just true. I mean, there are things that happen in my life and the first impulse I have is to call my dad. Um, and he's he died a year and a half ago. But it's still the first impulse I have uh, there. So I don't think there's anything really unusual about that. But then you add that with the fact, this, this other part of the question that I think is really important, where you say, how do I receive God's forgiveness when it doesn't feel like uh, I've been forgiven? That is a super common problem. And I, I'm finding that more and more and more, especially among younger Christians. And I know there are people who will, in every generation, they caricature um, the, the younger generation, usually in the sense that, well, they don't care about uh, the, the weightiness of sin. They don't uh, care about God's uh, holiness and so forth. I have found that to be not at all the case and as a matter of fact, the bigger problem is that in many cases, these are Christians who feel like God is angry at them. And it, what it leads to is even with people who uh, they understand that the Christian life doesn't mean sinless perfection, they do think, or at least they feel as though what it means to repent of sin means that this sin that you're grappling with, you now have complete and total victory over that sin. And there's some other sin that will come in and you will eventually get complete and total victory over that. And then you'll move on to the, to the next sin. That's not the way that this works. So sometimes I will have younger Christians who are actually plagued with this feeling of, of guilt um, when actually what, what they're experiencing is the Holy Spirit. They are experiencing repentance of sin and they're, they're, they're struggling and they're fighting against sin. And so the, the very thing that's causing them to doubt whether or not God is active in their, in their lives is the very indication that he is. Um, I just had this conversation with a, a college-age um, Christian uh, not long ago who said, well, 
Uh, is it is it right to say? Because my point was to say, God knows who you are. God knows what's uh, what's going on in your life, and what God's uh, and God's not shocked by any of that. And so you boldly come approaching the throne of grace, which means you're not trying to manipulate God into forgiving you, even if that manipulation is through some feeling that you have that that God has forgiven you. That's that's not what, um, you can't do that with God. God is eager to forgive uh, you. So what what I would say to that is this this college-age student said, well, is it right to say, that God is, he said, you know how your dad will sometimes say when you're a kid, uh, I'm disappointed in you. Is it, is it fair to say that God has that sort of reaction to us? And what I said is, you know, Jesus compares uh, the, the fatherhood of God with human uh, fatherhood in, in the sense that he says, how many of you who are fathers, if you're if your kid asked for a, a fish, would you give them a snake? Nobody. How much more so, God? But the, the important thing is the how much more so. So you can't make a one-to-one connection, um, which is why people who have had awful uh, uh, situations with a dad or have had completely absent uh, dads can still experience the, the fatherhood of God because it's not... Uh, the same as whatever it is that you have experienced. So to say God is disappointed in you, disappointed communicates, I expected something better of you and I'm surprised that you that you acted in a way that is less than what I would have uh, expected. I don't think that that's a fair uh, categorization uh, here. If if what you mean by that is that God is not pleased with sin, okay, yeah, that's true. And if what you mean by that is that God is going to uh, work in your life in, in order to do battle against that sin, okay, that's true also. Uh, when, the, when the Bible says that he, uh, as, a, as a father, disciplines his child, uh, that God is disciplining us, Sometimes I think the reason that that's confusing is because we think of discipline in terms of punishment, that what, what God is, is seeking to do is to say, well, you did this to me, and so I'm going to do this to you. That is not what the discipline of God is about. Uh, in that very same passage that you uh, talked about from 1 John, John goes on to say, uh, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Uh, in in the person of Jesus Christ who died for our sins and not for our sins only, but for those of the the whole world. So there is someone advocating for you with his own blood. So you're not kind of earning your way into favor with God and you're not, uh, God is not inflicting punishment on you if you are in Christ. The best example that I have uh, seen of this, best sort of analogy I was reading a collection of letters from C.S. Lewis, and he talked about walking a dog with a leash, and the dog gets wrapped around a lamppost. I didn't say lamppost. I guess I'm thinking of Narnia. Uh, It it gets wrapped around a a post of of some sort. And he said, what the the person is trying to do is to untangle the the leash, and the dog is thinking, I got to go. Well, why are you holding me back? And the dog's owner is saying, I know you want to go and I want you to go too. That's not going to lead you there. So I'm going to have to pull you back and you're going to be uh, frustrated by this. And you're going maybe to think that what I'm doing is taking something away from you when I'm really doing what's in your uh, best interest. That's that's how I think God's discipline works. It's, it's uh, the good shepherd your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That's not because the shepherd is disciplined or is punishing you, but he is going to be guiding you. Uh, no, 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 no. Come back from that ledge. No, 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 no. Go go this, go this direction. And where is he taking you? To green pastures uh, to, to lie down. So he has that in your best interest. So I think the 
the answer to your question about how do I receive God's forgiveness when I don't feel like it is just to notice when that's happening. I mean, I, I, I think that um, so I've known people who, when you say, well, you shouldn't feel that way, God has forgiven you. Then they start feeling guilty about the fact that they, that they don't feel that way, uh, and it just becomes a spiral. I say, just notice it. And uh, Jesus says, if you, if you knock, the door will be opened. If you, if you seek, uh, you will find. So I would just say, every time you notice that, where you say, okay, I know that God has forgiven me, but I don't feel like it that what you do is to say, uh, Father, I know that that has, I know that I'm having difficulty. Uh, I know with my mind that you've forgiven me, but I'm having difficulty feeling that with my heart. Would you help transform that part of me that I just don't have access to, uh, that, that I can rest in your forgiveness? And just if you notice it every time, one of the things that you'll find is that you're taking some of the you're taking some of the sting away from what's happening with your feelings saying to you, oh, no, 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 no. I don't think that God has forgiven you because that that has this assumption that if God has forgiven you, you're going to have this um, sort of emotional kind of release where you're realizing I'm forgiven and I know that I'm forgiven. Sometimes that happens, but often it doesn't. That's not what forgives you. Your, your, Your feeling is not what forgives you. Uh, you're forgiven by God on the basis of grace and, and God's inexhaustible mercy. And you receive that by faith, uh, but that faith is, um, by definition, the conviction of things not seen. So you're walking in a direction not by sight. So you're not always going to have uh, those feelings. As a matter of fact, most of the time, you're not going to have those feelings. And there are, there are many people who are completely forgiven of sin, and they don't ever feel that way. Uh, so just notice it uh, when, when it happens and ask God for, for help with it, is what I would say. Someone writes in and says, I'm confused on whether or not to read Surprised by Hope by N.T. Wright. He says, I'm hearing so much talk about him being foremost, whatever that means, in his field. But when looking up the book, I see a blurb by Rob Bell, uh, which which gave me pause. He said, I'm solid on what salvation is, and I believe that our hope in Christ calls calls us to live on earth as it is in heaven. But I, I never spend too much time thinking about how resurrection and the new heavens and new earth will work. Uh, mostly because I just trust that God has this and I need not try to figure it out. So all of this to say, I don't usually have any problem reading something I might possibly disagree with. No idea if I do or don't agree with N.T. Wright, but I don't feel solid enough on the material to understand where I should be disagreeing. And so he's he's asking about whether or not he should, he should read this. Okay. Um, I remember I had a colleague years and years ago, a seminary where I was teaching, who um, made uh, T-shirts that said, uh, N.T. Wright is not the devil (laughs) to give to people because in his circles, he was a New Testament scholar, um, uh, Wright was just so controversial uh, that everything tended to come down uh, to are you pro NT right or anti NT right? That's that's how influential he is, as you said, uh, in his particular uh, field. I don't agree with NT right on everything. I would um, I would understand justification uh, uh, differently than than he does. Although I understand what it is that he's um, what, what he's seeking to explain as he as he works through justification. I would I would see that differently, but I benefit from reading N.T. Wright uh, greatly. I mean, he, uh, in just about everything, his, his uh, series on um, the New Testament and the people of God, um, especially that volume on the resurrection of the Son of God, uh, it is the, I think it is the best work on the resurrection of Jesus that I have ever read uh, outside of the, the canon of Scripture. Uh, so this is somebody who's who's been um, very, very 
positive, in my view, uh, in terms of um, the, the church of Jesus Christ. So you're going to find things that you agree with. You're going to find things you disagree with. And then you're going to find other things where you think, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm just going to sit with this uh, for a while. Well, that's what, uh, that's what books are meant to do. It's when you're reading a book, what you're doing is kind of the same thing that you do when you walk up to someone and say, can I get your opinion on something? You know, can, can you help me to think through something? That doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to agree with the, the way that that person uh, explains or, or what the counsel is from that person. It means that you're learning something even when you do disagree uh, with that person. So uh, I would say uh, read everything with a Berean sense of uh, comparing this to searching the scriptures to see whether or not these things are so with everything uh, that, that you read outside of, of scripture. But I wouldn't make that decision on the basis of the, the Rob Bell blurb from a, a long time ago. Um, that doesn't really tell you anything. Uh, for a lot of reasons. I mean, a, a lot of times with these blurbs and endorsements, it's not that the author is saying, this is somebody I want to endorse. It's that the publisher is saying, this is someone that we think that some people in our audience uh, respect, and this person likes this book. That doesn't really tell you much. It, it might tell you about how good the book is in this person's perspective, but it doesn't tell you much about where that book is coming down. I mean, I have I have people who have blurbed books of mine way back in the day that, um, you know, I mean, I, 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 there are people who have blurbed some of my books that have uh, called or, or hinted that I'm a Marxist <laughs> since, you know, a lot of them. And uh, that that doesn't, if you, if you then see that and you say, oh, well, um, what does that then tell us about uh, all of my viewpoints? It just wouldn't. It, it just doesn't. And so I don't think there are some people who, who think in order for me to read something and in order for me to benefit from something, first, I have to make sure that it's safe. Meaning I have to make sure that it agrees with everything that I'm already thinking. Um, I just don't think that's the way to read. Um, I think instead, read in order to um, be skeptical in the right sense of what any human being would say or, or teach. So you're not receiving anything just because somebody says it, but uh, with an, an openness to say, what are some things in this I can learn? There are a lot of things that I learn in reading from people that I wouldn't agree with on almost anything. Um, but they're they're able to teach me something. So, for instance, I was just uh, with a group uh, today uh, talking about uh, an author that I really uh, admire and whose book, uh, The Righteous Mind, um, has been one of the most influential books in my life uh, over the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, Jonathan Haidt's an atheist, uh, and he's an atheist who writes in the book about awe and talks about that in terms of religious experiences or psychedelic mushrooms. I obviously would not uh, not agree with that at all, but I can learn uh, quite a bit from him in in the areas where he he is teaching me. In the same way that uh, I can have conversations with people with whom I disagree, and I can come away from that saying. That person, I don't agree with on 80% of the stuff, but they do know what they're talking about with this. Or they prompted me to ask some questions that I didn't have. Now, I'm not comparing N.T. Wright to that sort of an extreme situation by any means. N.T. Wright's brother in Christ, and I have a great deal of respect for him. I think you ought to read Surprised by Hope. I think it's a very good book. Um, and if sometimes what uh, what N.T. Wright does is maybe uh, emphasizes a little too strongly um, sort of what he sees as an overly spiritual view of heaven. I'm, I'm largely in, in line with him, but sometimes I think he's a little too strong on that. But that's okay, because 
we kind of need that within the church, just as you know, you need the person in the congregation who's gifted with um, evangelism, being the person who all the time is saying we got to do evangelism better. Um, I, I think that's I think that's good. Uh, that that's part of what brings uh, balance to um, to the people of God. And similar to that. Or someone who writes in about uh, the school system where his or her kids are and uh, saying that the school is censoring books and uh, keeping kids from books. And in this particular situation, it's books along the lines of um, uh, Martin Luther King's uh, letter to Birmingham jail. I've seen it in places where it's uh, Ruby biographies of Ruby Bridges. Uh, those sorts of things are being banned. And this person is saying, what do I do with reading to my daughter and, and, and how do I go about this? Now, uh, I think that in your case, uh, I would make a little bit of a distinction between uh, are the books that are being eliminated part of the curriculum or are the books in the library? Or, or are the books uh, recommended uh, further reading? That's going to make a difference to some degree. Uh, obviously, there are going to be some things that are outside, um, outside the parameters of what is age appropriate for kids. But this sense of um, coming in and ideologically uh, banning books just doesn't, doesn't lead to uh, any place good. Um, and so I, um, I was in a bookstore here in Nashville long ago, and there was a, a copy of Mouse, the uh, graphic novel, that was banned in a school district uh, here in Tennessee. And uh, the person at the bookstore behind the counter said, we can't keep it in stock because Mouse has suddenly become, uh, become so popular because people are saying, well, you know, why do people want to ban it? This is not... Uh, even if you're in agreement with uh, some ideas that are age appropriate, but you don't agree with, the answer to that usually is to counter that with more ideas and better ideas, not to remove those ideas from the, from the possibility of, uh, of kids finding them. So what I would say in that situation is teach your, your daughter how to read things that are age appropriate and with which you might disagree and teach her how to uh, determine uh, how to test things in terms of their truthfulness, in terms of um, their, their correspondence with the gospel, in terms of their, their value in, in any way. You can teach your child how to do that by um, reading a book and saying, if this look at where this person is is coming from. So, for instance, in our house, uh, one of the books we've always loved is uh, Maurice Sendak's Where the Wild Things Are. I've been reading that to my kids uh, when they were little all the way through, um, all of my sons. And there, there's uh, someone who said to me one time, I would never read Where the Wild Things Are to my children. And I said, why? And they said, because Max is so disobedient to his mother. I mean, he, he yells at her, uh, I'll eat you up. I, I would never want my child to yell at me, I'll eat you up. And you know, my response was, well, you, you, you make those decisions uh, in your household, but I wouldn't want my children screaming at me, I'll eat you up either, but that has never happened. <laughs> And, uh, and the, the reason that it's never happened is because I can read this book, which is about so much more than that incident. And then I can say, look at where this person's coming from. What's going on here? This is somebody who is scared by something and look at the way that he's, he's responding to that fear. He's, he's lashing out at the people who love him. He's sort of, sort of trying to protect himself. And then he goes to, to where the, the wild things are, where his fears are, and he learns how to conquer those fears. I mean, you can go through and show, here are places where I agree and disagree. I think that's generally a, a better way to go about it. All right, and then I have a question from Alex in Indianapolis who says, you can use my name and use my city. 
And he says, I'm a young professional with an interest in government and politics. And over the past couple of years, I've developed an increasingly clear call to some form of vocational public service. But I feel deeply disenchanted about the direction of both major political parties and sometimes question my ability to engage faithfully in the public square without compromising my Christian witness. How should I be thinking about this? Well, Alex, I get that question a lot, including from people who aren't like you are sort of at the beginning of their careers, but people who are well on uh, to their um, uh, to their political careers and have the same uh, the same sort of uh, wrestling. What what I would say to you, and I've written a little bit about this in the newsletter from time to time, is to say if somebody is being called into a a life of vocational public service, you need to recognize this is something of great benefit to the rest, or can be, a uh, great benefit to the rest of the world. And it can be spiritually hazardous to you. Both of those, those things are true. And, and one of the ways that you make this determination is by seeking as best you can to find out how spiritually hazardous this is going to be for you. So um, if, if you're the kind of person who is kind of uh, obsessed with politics and with winning, uh, or you're the kind of person who really needs a lot of external validation. And there, and there are a lot of people who go into politics because they need that kind of uh, external validation that comes with being the most popular person uh, in a particular race. If that's who you are, that's going to give you a lot of fuel and ambition uh, to, to go at the beginning but it's going to be very dangerous for you. The, the people that we need going into public service are people who are willing to lose an election and still have a life. They, they don't see an election as an existential threat because if you do, what's going to happen is that you're going to start having a greater and greater distance between your inner person and your outer behavior. Uh, what Jesus talks about when he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no, that the inner and the outer ought to be aligned. And when that's not the case, when what you start doing is you start looking around and saying, well, what does it mean for me to be acceptable uh, to the tribe? And you can start editing yourself and, and changing the way that you see things, not because you sit down and say, well, I believe A to be right but my party wants me to do B, so I'm going to say that I'm for that. Usually, that's not the way it happens. Sometimes it does. I mean, I've been on, I've been on uh, uh, news programs debating I issues with people who, during the commercial break, will say, yeah, you're right, this is crazy, and then turn around when the lights come back on, and they go right back to, to arguing. Most people aren't, aren't to that extreme, but what happens is you start kind of subconsciously saying, what are the ways that I can kind of make these uh, compromises, what seem like compromises to you, and you're always able to say, well, this is so that I can live to fight another day. That is a really dangerous, um, a dangerous place to be. So see and know whether or not, um, whether or not that's the case for you. And if you are somebody um, who doesn't fit into uh, one of the major uh, political parties, uh, there are still all sorts of things that you can do in public service. I mean, in some areas, uh, some of the, the local positions that are of great value and benefit, um, you can do that without getting as caught up in those national tribal uh, identity markers. And often those things change. So I, I don't think that you can, you know, if you just look back not that long ago, uh, you would have seen a Democratic Party in the era of uh, Bill Clinton, free trade, um, uh, tough on criminal justice. I mean, all of these emphases that Clinton had in a way that you could not have imagined uh, Bernie Sanders uh, in, in that sort of uh, context being a, a major figure. That's changed. 
And if you go back to the George W. Bush era, you've got a Republican Party, very internationalist, uh, free trade and, um, and intervention around the world uh, in a way that you never could have imagined, sort of the, the tariffs and um, protectionist uh, and, and isolationist strands that have become popularized since then. And that can change again. So, so be faithful. If God's called you to this, uh, don't uh, do what you think is wrong. Be willing to lose uh, elections. And sometimes uh, what you find is that the, the context just changes around you. So that would be uh, my advice. Final question. Uh, we have Anne who writes in and says she is a, a Canadian uh, listener. And she says that she's kind of exasperated with all the talk about rights. And she wants to know how Christians can even talk about rights. Uh, we're, we're the people who ought to be giving up our rights. And so she says, how should we think about this? Well, yes and no. Uh, we are the people who aren't uh, clamoring for our own uh, power. And we are the people who are going to give up uh, our own rights personally, often. If, if you're, uh, if you're a- asked to walk uh, one mile, you walk an extra mile. You get slapped in the face, you, you don't slap back. You turn the other cheek. Jesus says all of those things. That's a different thing than working for the rights of other people, which often means that in some circumstances, you have to advocate uh, for your own rights because they're going to affect the rights of other people. So you think about the Apostle Paul, for instance, at uh, Philippi um, in uh, Acts 16, uh, after the earthquake happens and the, the message from the magistrates is just sort of quietly go away. And Paul says, no, uh, you, you've acted unlawfully in, in treating a, a Roman, an uncondemned Roman citizen this way. And so you need to come publicly and make your charges. That's not because Paul is valuing his rights. It's because he understands that this is the, the just thing to do in terms, of, uh, in terms of other people. So there are going to be times when that's the important thing to do. There are going to be other times where, you know, Jesus with the temple tax, where he says to Peter, do we owe the temple tax? Children, the, the sons don't pay the, the tax. The subjects do. We're not subjects. Uh, we're sons of the kingdom. But, he says, so that we won't offend them, uh, we'll pay it. There are going to be circumstances where that's the reaction, where you say, I have a right, and I'm not going to, um, I- I'm not going to advocate for that right in this situation. That takes a lot of wisdom. So I do think there are rights, and I do think that it's important to, to maintain the fact that uh, government isn't giving you your rights, your family's not giving you your rights, your tribe's not giving you those rights. God has, has given you those things, and it's necessary for you to recognize them in order to know how to treat other people. That's different than becoming the sort of uh, interest group that is always saying, um, we're looking around to make sure that, that we get everything that we need to get. And so uh, often that then differentiates between um, what does it mean when we're being persecuted in such a way that will lead to the persecution of, uh, of future generations and, and other people. So if you're a, a chaplain and you're being told, well, you can't pray in Jesus' name, you're evangelical chaplain, or uh, you have to serve the Eucharist to everybody if you're a Roman Catholic chaplain. You can't do that, first of all, because um, it, it would be uh, unfaithful to your own calling. and You would have to, to give an answer from your conscience to God for that. But also because if you don't uh, speak on those things, you're going to end up in a situation where there, won't, there can't be any future uh, evangelical or Catholic chaplains. That's, that's not an easy step-by-step guide. That's not what we're given. Instead, we're given or we're, we're told to ask for the wisdom to be able to figure out when is the time that we speak in terms of our rights, but when are the times when we say we're simply going to hand those over and, um, 
and, and live without them. That takes some wisdom and Jesus does both and calls on us to do both in, in different circumstances and contexts. All right, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher or Pocket Cast or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you leave a review, that uh, helps people to find the show. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap the cover art and you can find uh, other resources for you. And be sure to send this to a friend who might uh, benefit from it. And while you're at it, check out Christianity Today, uh, which uh, is uh, covering so many important uh, issues in the Christian world right now. On that, By tapping that cover art, you can find out how you can get a trial membership. It'll be completely free for you to check it out. This is Russell Moore, and you're listening to the Christianity Today Public Theology Project's Russell Moore Show. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Eric Petrick is our chief creative officer. Russell Moore is the executive producer and our host. Mike Cosper is our director of podcasts. Administration for CT by Christine Kolb, Pam Vodanova, and Abby Perry. Production assistance by Core Media. Beth Grabencourt, coordinator. Kevin Duthu, producer and sound mixer. Our theme song is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hudden. If you like what you heard today, please consider subscribing so you don't miss any future episodes.